like to welcome everybody to this morning's presentation on the corporations law topic of director's duties. Um, my name is Paul Santa Maria, and I'm going to um, chair the function this morning. Um, this morning's topic of discussion, as you'll be aware, um, will be director's duties. Um, our great leader, Michael Green, um, our clerk, has been um, unavoidably uh, detained and uh, offers his apologies. I spoke to Michael a few minutes ago. He said he was still in bed reading the paper. Uh, he said he'd never heard of our two guest speakers, which is a bit disappointing as he is their clerk. He said that as far as he was concerned, the only duties directors had were, were to put the bins out on the right night and that he was completely unaware and moreover quite surprised to hear that the Uniform Companies Act of 1961 had been repealed. <laughs> um, I hope that uh, that gives you a lot of faith in our clerk. Um, Michael is um, at another function about 50 metres away and I expect to see him fairly <coughs> shortly and um, there's no need to repeat to him anything <laughs> of what I've just said. Now these breakfast seminars have become something of a signature dish for the Greens list and I can say that as a new member of the list um, re recruited by Michael as uh, pick number 210 in last year's end of season draft. Uh, at that time I was a member of another list and Michael rang me and invited me to uh, be a guest at the breakfast seminar in grand final week, uh, I think it was, at which the uh, former great Carlton coach and Hawthorne Premiership captain, David Parkins, spoke. Uh, it was a terrific function. Uh, Michael promised me that all of the breakfast seminars had similarly exciting topics. <laughs> so here we are talking about director's duties in the Corporations Act. Uh, with the greatest of respect to our two guests, to our two speakers, I think I may have been sold a pup. But before I introduce Simon and Dean, um, I would like to acknowledge the uh, generosity of uh, CCH Australian Legal Publications um, in providing us this morning with a uh, much sought after door prize. And so we have a copy of its recent publication Lessons in Corporate Governance from the Global Financial Crisis. Um, this one's been autographed by Bernie Madoff. Um, and I'm, I'm told you won't be able to put, put it down. Now, um, not that what I'm about to ask has anything to do with how the door prize is going to be awarded. But I'd just like to know if there are any Carlton supporters in the room. Uh, you're in with a chance. Uh, if there are any Collingwood and Essendon supporters, there's no need to wait round. Um, our first speaker this morning, I think, is Simon Pitt. Um, I won't need to go through um, Simon's biography because it is, um, with the usual alacrity of uh, Michael Green and his staff, contained in the bundle of um, papers um, which we have this morning, and I'm hoping that everyone has with them. So um, I've had the opportunity of reading the paper overnight. I think it's a tremendous um, piece of work, if I may say. Uh, and I think this morning's discussion will be to all of our advantage as I welcome Simon to the lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Paul. It's um, always good to start off a morning this early with a, a bit of a laugh, and uh, I knew that Paul would not disappoint in that respect. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction. The profile, just for a moment of shameless self-promotion, um, includes a case called Port of Portland in the state of Victoria, where um, I was with James Merrills, Jim Merrills, and we got special leave. Um, I think we need to update this because we won 7-0 in the High Court a few months later. So there you go. Um, director's duties. I hope you've all had your coffee. Um, I'm going to give a bit of a thumbnail sketch about the sort of key provisions that uh, 
involve director's duties in the Corporations Act. And uh, the topic is quite extensive. Uh, the relevant sections of the Act are reproduced at the back of the paper for you to have a look at. And um, I'll go through sections 180 to 184 and uh, talk to you a little bit about the law. Um, and then Dean Luxton will give you the interesting stuff. He'll talk to you a little bit about recent decisions and how those sections have been applied um, by the courts over the last few years. So my part's a little bit like eating dry wheat bix and uh, Dean will add the milk, as it were. Um, just to kick off, it's probably important to say that historically the standard of conduct expected of directors um, was a subjective standard. That is to say that directors were judged or their conduct was looked at on the basis of what they knew rather than what they ought to have known and what they did rather than what they ought to have done. And um, the sentiment has shifted substantially since that time towards an objective standard, which is now reflected in the Corporations Act. And certainly recent um, high profile collapses such as HIH, OneTel, James Hardy, etc., and the global financial crisis have set the scene for a number of very hotly contested cases which have provided a very rich body of um, common law and shone a very bright light on the key sections of the Corporations Act to do with directors' duties. Um, if I would say one thing against the vast repository of common law that we now have, it's that it's heavily weighted towards financial decisions or financial uh, matters, if you like. Um, and it would be good to see similarly detailed jurisprudence, in my view, on things like directors' duties, whether or not to enter into a merger, whether the board can use or dispose of voting rights, or whether to grant termination benefits, for example, to a departing CEO. Um, those sorts of decisions and those sorts of considerations don't really feature that heavily in the common law at the moment because of the heavy weighting towards, as I say, the financial type matters. Um, be that as it may, um, there's certainly, thanks to these recent decisions, a strong desire, no doubt, of company directors to avoid having their names mentioned in the same breath as Rich and Silberman and Visard and uh, Williams, Greaves, Vines, etc., and perhaps Scase and Bond for old times' sake. Um, several contrarian commentators um, have argued recently that the law of directors' duties has in fact gone too far. Interestingly, that includes Tony Delosio, who, uh, as we know, was heading up ASIC, um, and he commented that <coughs> courts don't have a legitimate role in second-guessing um, the decisions of directors in the boardroom. And if I understand Mr Delosio's position correctly, his concerns are quite valid in one respect because um, the sheer uh, force with which ASIC has pursued these directors and applied these provisions might cause the directors to balk at taking on a role as a director in a publicly listed company or may indeed cause them to second guess themselves in the decision making process within the boardroom. And that's certainly not what I think being a company director is all about. You need to be in a position where you make decisions quickly, sometimes with limited information, um, and you need to inform yourself, of course, about the matters that lead you to make the decision, but uh, certainly there'd be a lot of directors in public companies after all this law's been handed down that 
be like a cat on a hot tin roof, just wondering what lies ahead if you make a bad call. There's an interesting paper which is mentioned in paragraph four of the, of the uh, paper. Neil Young, QC, has uh, done a paper on director's duties, which is there, and the citation's given. I, I recommend that to you. It's a good, very good piece of work. It provides a balanced viewpoint. And just following on quickly from those contrarian views, it's perhaps of some relief to company directors that the business judgment rule is there in section 180 subsection 2 of the Corporations Act, which provides something of a safe harbour for directors who have been acting for all intents and purposes in good faith. And that section recognises, importantly, that company officers do often have to make decisions quickly and under pressure and that those decisions ought not attract the close scrutiny of the courts who, of course, have the unquestionable benefit of hindsight in analysing all of the facts. So I suppose I'll just skip over the rest of the introduction and launch into an overview of the uh, director's duties. As I say, the most relevant law is found in the Act at sections 180 to 184. Those sections don't replace the general law duties. So section 185 sets that out specifically. It says that those sections have effect in addition to and not in derogation of any rule of law relating to the duty or liability of a person because of their office or employment in relation to a corporation. And that's illustrated by um, reference to a body of law relating to negligence of directors. So there's still a repository of common law dealing with the negligence of, of directors, negligence in a common law sense as opposed to uh, arising out of statute. Uh, and again, 180 to 184 are not the only statutory provisions within the Corporations Act which directors must observe. Um, there are a number of others scattered throughout the Corporations Act. For instance, the duty to prevent insolvent trading under Section 588 capital G of the Act. Those sections are with, sort of outside the scope of this paper. Um, we've only got until sort of quarter to nine, so we'll skip over those. Also, importantly for the purposes of analysing these provisions, director is a very broad term. And it includes things like shadow and de facto directors. Uh, persons whose advice, instructions or wishes are customarily followed by the board. And there's a very good discussion of the distinction between de facto directors, shadow directors and normal directors or officers in the case of Chameleon Mining and Murchison Metals and that citation is given there. So just going through the key sections, um, the principles that I'm going to cover are largely drawn from the decision of Justice Santow in Asik and Adler. Um, it's a quite a seminal decision, it's extensive and um, Justice Santow goes through each of the key sections and provides some key uh, propositions, if you like, and authorities for those propositions. <coughs> You'll probably all be reasonably familiar with the facts of Adler, Rodney Adler, arose of course from the collapse of the HIH group of companies. I won't go through the facts um, in detail, but Justice Santow found that there were several directors of, uh, sorry, se several breaches, I beg your pardon, of directors' duties by both the executive def directors, Williams and Federa, and non executive director Adler. So, touching first on section 180, the duty of care and diligence. Um, directors owe a duty of care and skill at common law and in equity. Um, 
It's framed in similar terms to its predecessor, section 232, subsection 4 of the um, corporation's law. And the duties imposed upon directors by the statutory provision are largely similar or the same as the duties imposed upon direction, uh, directors under the old common law. And coming back to that objective idea or the objective test, in determining whether a director has exercised reasonable care and diligence, one must ask what an ordinary person with the knowledge and ex experience of the defendant might be expected to have done in the circumstances if he or she was acting on their own behalf. So that objective test um, is important and you can see immediately phrases like care and diligence, reasonable person, the company's circumstances, etc., etc. Courts face a difficult task of interpretation of those sections because each alleged breach has to be weighed up against the circumstances that the director found himself or herself in at the time and the environment within which the director made the decision. So if you're defending one of these cases, it's a forensically extensive exercise. You have to go into a detailed analysis of the specific circumstances, what was happening at the time, what was happening with the company, the, the climate within which the decision was made, etc., etc. So courts do face a difficult sort of task of interpretation there. Um, and there's an immediate need, as you can see, for very detailed proofs of evidence. Um, and you really need to drill down into finding out exactly what uh, context the decision was made in. And although the standard of reasonable care is generally said to be that of an ordinary prudent person, there is some suggestion that directors of a professional trustee company owe a higher duty of care. Well, I would suggest that that's just an illustration of the point that's already been made. Um, you have to look at the company, look at what it does, individual circumstances. Are they a qualified accountant? Are they a qualified lawyer? Ought they be held to a higher standard than perhaps somebody without those qualifications? The answer to that's probably yes. And the following paragraphs really are just a, a sort of an extension of that, of that theme. Paragraph 26, a director appointed to a company because of special expertise in an area of the company's business is not relieved of the duty to pay attention to the company's affairs which might reasonably be expected to attract inquiry even outside that area of expertise. Um, again, um, another example of the need to look very carefully at the particular circumstances and the particular climate within which a decision was made. 27 picks up on an important point. A general law, a director is entitled to rely without verification on the judgment, information and advice of management and other officers appropriately so entrusted. Pausing there, there's another important section in the Corporations Act, section 189, which provides a release valve or an escape route for directors who, in good faith, rely on advice of others and reports of others. And a good illustration of that is perhaps where a director obtains a valuation for one of the company's assets or obtains a re report, an extensive report from a consultant on a particular point outside perhaps the board's experience. The board of directors can reasonably expect that that sort of information is accurate. Another good example is perhaps where an outside accountant has been, or, or an auditor indeed, has been brought in to audit the company's accounts. Directors ought to rely upon that kind of information and they ought to be able to rely on that information in reaching decisions out about how to move the company forward. 
directors are not expected to have a skill set which encompasses valuations, accounting, law, etc., etc. They have to be able to farm work out. And the protection is there. It's available for company directors when they do so in good faith. Paragraph 28, there's um, a number of important factors which need to be taken into account when determining reasonableness in that context. And the function that has been delegated is such that it may properly be left to such officers. B, the extent to which the director is put on inquiry or given the facts of a case should have been put on inquiry. So if there's a big red flag in the audited accounts which lead a director on a train of inquiry somewhere and the director hops off a stop too early, gets off that train and doesn't follow it through, perhaps, of course, applying a, just a, a common sense approach to this. If they ought to have been put on a, a good train of inquiry and they didn't follow it through, then perhaps that might be held to be a breach. Another example, D, the risk involved in the transaction and the nature of the transaction. The extent of steps taken by the director, for example, inquiries made or other circumstances engendering trust, whether the position of the director is executive or non-executive. There's a whole different topic about the difference in um, levels of diligence required from or expected of executive and non-executive directors and the cases that Dean will talk about are peppered with those sorts of distinctions. Non-executive directors usually don't have a contract with the company whereas executive directors do. Non-exec directors, for instance a chairman, are often brought on to fulfil a certain role and might not be expected to have the depth of knowledge of certain aspects of the company that an executive director does, those sorts of considerations. And 2930, again, I'm not going to go through the paper in detail, um, but there are some more uh, examples of the duty of care and diligence in, in those paragraphs. Paragraph 32, I think it's important just to pause in the discussion of the duty of care and diligence to touch on the company's circumstances. Um, those words in the company's circumstances are uh, very important and they pick up on something I was discussing before about the need to analyse the, the particular environment within which a decision was made. Justice Brereton in Asic and Maxwell um, gave an example or a list of things which the company's circumstances can include and it's useful just to have a quick look at that. So things like the type of company, the provisions of its constitution, the size and nature of the company's business, the composition of the board, the director's position and responsibilities within the company, the particular function the director is performing, the experience or skills of the particular director, the terms on which he or she has undertaken to act as a director, the manner in which responsibility for the business of the company is distributed between its directors and employees, and the circumstances of the specific case. So you start to get an idea about what's meant by the, the, the climate, the context within which a particular decision was made. Um, the courts will take into account the company's circumstances, and all of those things are relevant to look at. And ASIC and McDonald, again, um, provides a few more examples. Um, the competence of the company's management, the competence of the company's advisors, um, distribution of responsibilities between directors and other officers. So much for 180. Just moving quickly now to 181, which is the duty to act in good faith. And back to Adler, Justice um, Santow's decision at paragraph 735. It's a big decision. So a director as a fiduciary, of course, director-company relationship is, is a recognised class of fiduciary, uh, of importing fiduciary obligations. A director is under an obligation not to promote his personal interest or hers, 
by making or pursuing a gain in circumstances where there is a conflict or real or substantial possibility of a conflict between his personal interests and those of the company. Now that seems reasonably obvious and straightforward, I would suggest. Um, similar to um, the duty not to or to avoid a conflict of interest, not to make a personal gain, not to use information that's been obtained by position as, as, as director for your personal gain or the gain of somebody else close to you. Seems reasonably straightforward. So it's consistent really with the duty to act for proper purposes in good faith and for the best interest of the corporation. Paragraph 36, nonetheless, a director may act with a personal interest even though the director has not freed his, his or her mind of that personal interest when acting, provided that this personal interest was not the actuating motive rather than some bona fide concern for the benefit of the company as a whole or for fairness as between members. Well, that's the decision of Justice Chief Justice Latham in Mills and Mills. Um, so in certain circumstances, um, such as a director in a position of power and influence over the board, mere disclosure of a conflict between interest and duty and abstaining from voting is insufficient to satisfy a director's fiduciary duty. The director may also be under a positive duty to take steps to protect the company's interest, such as by using such power and inf influence as he had to prevent the transaction going ahead. Coming back to the facts of Adler, here um, neither Mr Adler nor Mr Williams and failing them Mr Fadira did anything um, to have the following reach the investment committee or the board, that is the payment of the $10 million, the formation of the um, AEUT and its investment in HIH. Um, this allowed the subsequent unlisted investments and loans to be made with no properly approved mandate permitting this and no specific approval or ratification within a reasonable time thereafter. Now, just coming back briefly to Adler, just to put some context on that. Um, money was made available and paid by a parent company to a subsidiary with which the subsidiary purchased shares in the parent company. And the payment was made in such um, circumstances where there are no proper safeguards in place. The payment didn't come to the notice of the other company directors and it did not receive approval of the investment committee. And in the face of a considered decision to reduce the company's exposure to tech stocks, the parent company went ahead and invested in three businesses of that type. Those businesses um, were in need of significant capital to continue doing business, were encountering difficulties in raising new capital, capital, and were having cash flow difficulties such that there was a significant risk that those businesses would fail. So um, you can see there immediately that those decisions were made um, in a climate where on any view, there's just significant problems with, with the way they were made, the context, the secrecy with which they were made, um, and it's no surprise that, uh, that those directors were held to have uh, breached their duties under section 181. The Mr Adler, who was a director of also Adler Corporation, um, was held to have exercised his powers for the benefit or gain of a second company without clearly disclosing the second company's interests to the first company and obtaining the first company's consent. Paragraphs 40 to 42, just again touch on the um, objective standard. Section 182, the use of position. So there's a duty to uh, not use your position as a director 
to gain a, an advantage for themselves or someone else or cause a detriment to the corporation. <clears throat> so an example of that is um, failing to end an agreement that pays reasonable benefits to a related consultant after the director should realise that the company is insolvent, breaches section 182 and obtaining an agreement in a manner which keeps any independent director in the dark is strong evidence that the benefits are unreasonable, as is the lack of any evidence as to what the director did for the company in return. And a number of other um, examples follow. I just want to leave a little bit of time to talk about um, criminal offences, but... Um, You'll note that there's an absence of section 183. Um, 183, of course, uh, is reproduced in the paper, but it deals with the use of information. Um, now, it, it's similar considerations arise in respect of 183 as arise in 182, so we're not going to go over that in any detail. Um, so perhaps just moving on um, to section 184. 184 is the criminal provision. Really, it just rolls up the previous three sections and applies them in a criminal context. Um, so a director may contravene a statutory duty with criminal consequences if the director is reckless or intentionally dishonest and fails to act in good faith, in the best interest of the company, or for a proper purpose, and so on. There's a number of cases in which sentencing principles in contravention of 184 are discussed, such as Williams, Adler and Federa. Those were the criminal uh, flow-on cases from the uh, decision of, Adler, of, of Justice Santo and Adler. So the knowledge aspects of the offences under 184 are governed by Part 5.4 of the Commonwealth Criminal Code. So we come into an analysis of um, what are the, the, the knowledge elements. So a criminal breach requires either recklessness or intentional dishonesty by a company director or officer. Um, what's recklessness? Well, a, a company director will act recklessly when he or she is aware that a substantial risk that a circumstance or result exists or will exist and having regard to the circumstance known, it is unjustif unjustifiable to take the risk. And examples of recklessness include where there's been a failure to make proper investigations or inquiries, where documents have been signed with knowledge that the documents have been backdated and where a director had made misleading statements to shareholders. And similarly, intention is dealt with in paragraph 54. Criminal cases, of course, are investigated by ASIC and they're brought by the Department, the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions. So needless to say, um, if you think a director has been guilty of breaching section 184, it's not an action that you can bring yourself. The penalties are severe, as you'd know from the... Um, punishment of some of the directors in the high profile corporate collapses include fines of $220,000 for each offence and imprisonment up to five years for each offence. So um, in the context of a number of different breaches, obviously the penalties, you'd be packing a toothbrush for a very long time. Um, I'm You'll be pleased to know that's probably the end of, of the analysis of the relevant sections. Um, what I propose to do, if time permits still, is just hand over to Dean. I may come back, time permitting, I may come back and talk to you a little bit more about the business judgment rule, but um, I'll probably hand over to Dean to make a start. Well, I think what we might do, um, Simon, is to have a 10 minute break so we can replenish our cups of uh, tea and coffee. Um, but before we do that, I, I think it's interesting 
listening to Simon's uh, talk and reading the paper, how all of these statutory pr provisions, when you step back and look at the way in which the law has developed in the last uh, 10, 20 years, um, when one steps back and, and sees the development of these provisions, just how far we have come from um, the simple, unadulterated view of separate legal entity, because all of these statutory provisions, and to a lesser extent, the general law decisions, are really a collateral attack on the principle of separate uh, legal entity. So a creditor um, of a company who hadn't been paid a debt 20 or of a $2 company 20 years ago really had nowhere to go. Um, now the situation is entirely different and I see we have in our audience uh, Barry Woods. Um, although Simon's paper didn't deal with um, insolvent trading, um, uh, Barry was the solicitor for the um, defendant, Mrs Morley, in the case of Statewide Tobacco and Morley. Um, and that was another uh, case which really uh, tended to refocus the court's attitude towards the standard of care which um, directors were obliged to discharge. And Mrs Morley was, I think, Barry in her 70s at the time. Um, she was uh, the defendant of, um, in a, an application for um, uh, compensation for um, trading while insolvent, a company that had been run uh, by her son, effectively to her exclusion. But that case in the development of Victorian law was something of a watermark in the development of um, the, the standard of care which directors um, would owe. And um, Simon made the point that uh, while these leading cases have a bias towards um, financial matters and tend to involve um, high-profile individuals, the, the, the significance of these large-ish decisions um, is the development of principle, which is what we take from the decisions and enable us to give reliable and quick advice to our clients. I just want to say something about um, uh, Simon and, and the paper. Um, I've um, watched um, Simon really since he's um, come to the bar. We used to park our cars in the same car park actually and I've, I've um, watched his uh, practice grow. And the thing that really impresses me ab about him, um, uh, quite apart from the depth of knowledge displayed in the paper and in the talk, is that um, he has been Honorary Secretary of the Victorian Bar Council for I think it was about three years and is now a member of the Bar Council and on top of that teaches in the Reader's Course. And uh, I can tell you um, that those tasks involve an enormous amount of time. And so I think it's very impressive when um, one is able to develop a practice and yet uh, give to the Bar and to the teaching within the profession the way Simon has done. Uh, as they say, if you want something done, you ask a busy person. So I'd like you to thank Simon for the first half of uh, this morning's session.